What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then hello. My name is Erica and it is an absolute pleasure to have you joining us today on the channel because for today's video, as you can see from the title, I am chatting to a very well-known ancient history creator here on YouTube by the name of Dr. Garrett Ryan. Now, Garrett runs three separate, incredibly successful YouTube channels to the point where he puts all of us to shame. And those three channels are titled Told in Stone, Told in Stone Footnotes, and Scenic Roots to the Past. Now, the first channel is more so a traditional history channel, which is short form 10 minute videos pretty much that just dive into one particular question and uncover one thing in particular or do sort of one mission statement. Then Told in Stone Footnotes is a podcast where Dr. Ryan invites on a bunch of different guests to really get into all of their research, to get into their publications, all of that sort of in-depth history lover content that I adore. I have absolutely devoured every single video on that channel, I'm not gonna lie. And then the third channel is a travel channel, actually, where Garrett brings us round the historic sides to modern cities like Rome, as well as taking us on tours of various museums, including the British Museum. And as somebody who lives in London and has been to the British Museum so many times, I can say that this was a very good tour, leading you guys around things that normally people wouldn't even stop by in the British Museum. I thought he did a really, really good job with that. So that's what all three channels are. Now, for you guys who did not know about Garrett, Dr. Ryan, prior to this chat, you guys can find all of his links in the description below. So at any point you guys can go and subscribe or check out any of those various platforms, various different types of content, because we are going to spend today talking about your journey, Garrett, and talking about, you know, what brought you to the classics, how you ended up becoming so big on YouTube, being a published author, uh, this incredible, dare I say it, public historian career that you have kind of stumbled into. But before we can get into all of that, do you want to start us off actually by telling us about your classics background? Like I know it's difficult, or at least you've said that it's difficult for you to kind of pinpoint a moment where you really loved classics and when you really discovered classics, but is there, I guess, a journey that you can take us on that would help us understand the context of you that we would need to know in order to understand Told in Stone. I was always fascinated by history. I can't remember a time when there wasn't a, I wasn't intrigued by the past in some, you know, some way or other. But as an American, uh, Roman history always had a special kind of allure because it was, you know, often the old world. It was, you know, the definitive old world empire in some way. So I think for me, um, a deciding moment when I got serious in my interest about Rome came when I was 14 and went to Europe for the first time. Um, my, my parents um, had spent time in college in Europe, and they brought me and my sister with them uh, to visit their colleges. My mom studied in Rome uh, back in the early 80s. And so um, suddenly seeing Rome, the Forum, the Pantheon, the Colosseum uh, was almost overwhelming to my my 14-year-old eyes. There was so much there, so much layered and such deep history. I remember especially uh, my parents' hotel was maybe a few blocks from the Pantheon. And uh, so I, I walked there my first jet lagged day in Rome um, and, and just seeing it there in all of its monumental vastness, being able to touch those granite columns. I, I think that moment, if there's any conversion experience in my life, um, that that's it. That, that's when I, I really said, there's something here I want to learn more about. Um, and uh, after that, I came back, I started high school a few months later and took Latin, which is kind of hard to do in the American public school system. Um, but I had a good teacher. And I think that she also helped to inspire me to learn more and learn more deeply. So before going to Rome then, like, did you know what you were walking into? Or were you just kind of like, I get to go on holiday with my parents and my family, <laughs> and this is going to be so fun? A uh, little column A, little column B, I suppose. You know, when you're 14, you know, the, the world's a, a hazy and wonderful place. Uh, so I did know a little bit about Roman history. I'd read a bit in kind of, you know, world history books, so those big omnibus, heavily illustrated books you get when you're a kid. But I had never read an ancient source or anything like that. You know, I, I'd never read deeply. And so I, I think that experience is what really tipped me over from, this is kind of neat, to this is really neat. And, you know, 
and then the PhD followed, I guess, indirectly. Well, it's funny just because, so I remember the first time that I went to Rome and obviously living in London, I can go pretty much yeah. whenever, <laughs> especially like pre-pandemic flights were mm-hmm. so cheap. And I remember going when I was like maybe eight or nine. And I distinctly remember going into the Pantheon and mm-hmm. hating it. I was like, this is so <laughs> boring. What are we looking at? What are we doing? And my poor dad was like trying to film the whole thing and like, mm-hmm. you know, sort of the OG vloggers, just home videos. <laughs> and I like, you can see me in the corner of all of these videos, like drinking my Fanta, complaining. <laughs> oh, I, absolutely. And if you brought me when I was nine, I probably would have my own Fanta or something like that. <laughs> and you know, been staring at the marble walls, but I was just old enough to be, have it be more than a cool experience. I would be like, this is something that I want to work with, you know, we'll inquire more deeply into. So then fast forward to your undergrad years and mm-hmm. you end up taking classical languages, which I think is really interesting because I think that languages tend to be the thing that puts people off classics. Like people like, oh, I don't want to do Latin or oh, Greek seems a bit weird. So what was it about the languages that pulled you in so much to then get your under- undergraduate even degree in it? I would say that I regarded it as a necessary evil, to be honest. You know, I have no great love of Latin grammar. Maybe there's someone somewhere who does, but it's not me. Um, you know, it, to me, it was a means to an end. Uh, you know, I, I knew by the time I was uh, a junior in college um, that I wanted to go do this professionally. I wanted to go into grad school. And I knew for that, I'd have to have language background. And I went to a small liberal arts college where there wasn't a very large program in the classics. It was just classical studies, which was more in translation, you know, the intro stuff. Um, or classical languages. And I was one of two students in my year who did classical languages. That was it. It was very, a lot of very small classes. Um, but you know, we learned Latin and Greek thoroughly enough to be able to read sources in the original. Um, and, and as I did this, once I got over the agony of learning, you know, the, the Greek aorist or, you know, the, the participles in Latin, uh, I began to see that the beauty of the languages of, of the literature in the original, you know, you read it in a different way, of course, new wood in translation. And so it had a value that came to me gradually and painfully, but it was more just, I discovered that I wanted to do this, or I decided I wanted to do this in grad school and knew that there was no other way around learning the languages as well as I could um, to get to that goal. So what was that jump like with the languages from high school to college? Was that like really Mm -hmm. dire and really different or did you have so much in your back pocket that it was all sort of, you know, just falling into place at that point? So you know, I did high school Latin, as I mentioned, and um, I really didn't do it well enough to make college a painless transition because it was a learning experience. You know, I started it towards the end of this, the introductory sequence in my college's Latin, uh, you know, one, two, three, four. Um, I knew no Greek. Uh, Greek was an acid bath. But, um, you know, so again, once you learned the basics, it, it was logical enough. You know, I don't know if I had any special talent for languages, but it was, you know, I could memorize things at least fairly easily. And so that eventually got to the point where I could, you know, power through text. Um, but the, the beauty came later when I started, when it, when it wasn't such a, you know, a barrier to entry, like, oh, you know, oh God, it's some Homer. It's more like, a, oh, it's some Homer. You know, I kind of know where this is going, I know the vocabulary, I can kind of see, you get into the rhythm of it. Um, but it took me a while to get to that point where it wasn't just, you know, regarding with dread my pile of homework for the evening and saying, well, all right absolutely like I so I did Latin primarily because I did classical studies and at Mm -hmm. NYU at least I don't know how it was at your university but in order to do classics at all if you want to do classical languages or classical studies you had to have at least one language Mm -hmm. so I didn't want to do archaeology which was the other option because I don't like pots and I don't like (laughs) dirt and things like that so I was like I want to read Mm -hmm. and they said well you have to do Latin and I had no Latin at all. Uh, mm-hmm. So I had like 9 a.m. every day, two hours of Latin. There was a lot of crying. There was a lot of struggle. <laughs> and I was just among all these people that were so good at it naturally. And they were like, oh no, obviously this is how it is. And you've got the wrong ablative. And I was like, there are multiple ablatives. <laughs> Why? <laughs> there are all the ablatives. <laughs> uh, yes, no, I think we all we have those moments, whether or not we acknowledge them to ourselves, where you just kind of wring your hands and wonder why you're doing this, you know, this terrible thing that you voluntarily signed up for. Um, you know, and I had, uh, actually initially I'd wanted to be an archeologist. You know, I, I was so fascinated by the ruins. And then I discovered belatedly what actually is involved in archeology, span which is mostly, as you said, pots and looking at pots and uh, discovered I didn't have the patience for that and went more the history route. So what made you want to be an archeologist? 
I think that same experience of you know, the Pantheon in Rome, I was fascinated by the ancient world. And I, I like the idea of the the tactile part of it, being to discover things, you know, with a spade and, you know, to, to seeing that the buildings and the statues ever come to light. And then discovered actually it's, it's just shards of pottery, you know, there's thousands <laughs> of shards of pottery and cataloging them and silently hating them. Um, one of my campus jobs, I worked the classics department at, at, at Carlson, my, my undergrad college. And I had to catalog the, their pottery collection. They had all these slides, and I was responsible for labeling them correctly. And I think three weeks of that was enough to say, okay, I'm I'm not going to do this as a career. I, I can I can cope with this, and you know, reading about it, I'm not going to spend my life in these trenches. <laughs> well, then you go and you do a semester abroad in Rome, and I mm-hmm. would love to know what that was like. Like, did you guys have a really strict course? What were your days like? If you can remember, like. That must have been such an incredible experience. It was. I was lucky enough to get into the ICCS program. It's this consortium of American colleges that is based in Trest Avery. And there's only about 40 students in the program. We came from 38 different colleges and universities, uh, so from all over the country. And all of us was in the classics. You know, We were either classics majors or classical studies majors. And the curriculum was focused exclusively on the classics. So you had to do Greek or Latin, Italian. And then the premier course, which was called the Ancient City, was all about the city of Rome. And that was the fun part because at least once a week, there'd be a field trip to some building or monument in the city. And we'd learn on site. We'd go to the forum and say, okay, this temple is built at this point by this person. Here's why it's important. Um, or we'd take you know longer excursions down to the Bay of Naples, say, or Sicily once. Um, and so it really was just an absolute immersion in the ruins and the study of the classical world. And I, I had a wonderful time. That sounds really similar to my experience. So I studied abroad in Athens, but Mm -hmm. I didn't do it with other classics majors. So at NYU, they had an Athens study abroad during the summer. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, like everybody just saw that as they can go to Greece and they can have a great time and they'll be island Mm -hmm. hopping. But it was exactly how you described. It was a lot of like, we had to go to museums together or like sites together and it would be Mm -hmm. like class on site. And these poor non-classics people were like, what in the world did we sign up for? And I'm loving it. Like we're in my scene, I'm crying and (laughs) the whole thing. (laughs) I think for anybody who's interested in this stuff, you know, having that firsthand contact in that structured way, it is just, it's a cool experience and there's no way around it. And having it where everyone with you was also a classicist um, was both daunting in its way, but also I think you get just great discussions about this stuff. You even have a dinner. It's like, oh, that was cool. This was cool. Here's why it was cool. Um, And so kind of, uh, you know, collective geeking out that that was a fun experience. It must have also been like challenging in a really positive way, though, to be in that environment. I think so. You're inspired to do well, you know, when when it's not like you're not the only person striving, you know, in your solitary way towards the goal of mastering the ablative or whatever. Um, There's 30 of you who are struggling to master the ablative. And uh, yeah, it, it was a weird experience for someone who was so accustomed to very small classes or you know independent study. And uh, of course, you know, the, all, almost my only experience of that because I went back to Carleton afterward and then went on to a grad program that was also pretty small. But um, yeah, I think a formative experience and a very positive one overall. So you mentioned taking Italian. How mm-hmm. was your Italian? <laughs> I was never to the point where I was anything like fluent. I mean, I, I can still read Italian reasonably well. Um, of course, doing Latin, you know, that helps you there too. But uh, even when I go to, I was in Italy just this uh, this past uh, fall uh, for a few weeks, and um, I was reminded how rusty I was. You know, I, I can study it up and get my phrases and stuff, but uh, I'm not very good at hearing it, to be honest. So, it's well, I think that more... is a different discipline, though. To converse it is, it is. versus reading. It is. It's different to the mental muscles, I think. And as you know, we're we're trained as classicists just to read stuff and reading stuff. Okay, fine, that I can do. But uh, you know, speaking these languages that I'm supposed to be able to read, you know, so well, it it really. There's the different different kind of gaps to fill in, I think, and often I'm not filling them terribly well in real time, I suspect. But oh well. especially with the rhythm of spoken language, which is so different to reading, of course, like mm-hmm. Latin or something else that you you get into your own rhythm in your head, and you're like, okay, this is how everything should sound, and that's mm-hmm. completely fine. And then to hear something, you're like, whoa, <laughs> that's oh, yeah, what right. it's supposed it's... to sound like. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I'm sure even my, my videos now, I'm sure I mispronounce things on a regular basis. And I'm told so in the comments, of course. But, um, you know, again, it, it's good to belatedly learn these things. So. so let's talk about your PhD then, because mm-hmm. in an interview, you said the title of your PhD, at least what I think was at least something along the lines of your title, which mm-hmm. was 
Roman Asia Minor and how public spaces shaped interactions between the Romans and their subjects. Was that the title or something? That's the, the that's the, the synopsis pretty much. Um, actually, you can kind of see it. It's the there's those three books on top of the shelf there. It's the blue one in the middle uh, was, my, was my thesis that I ended up publishing. Um, and it, so it was called Placing Power, um, Greek Cities and Roman Governors in Imperial Asia Minor. And it was about, um, as you alluded, to the ways that public pl public places, um, agoras slash forums, uh, large monumental streets, public buildings, um, were part of the dialogue between traveling Roman governors and their elite subjects. Uh, Roman governors did many things in their provinces, but their primary duty was to try cases. And they would do this circuit court, pretty much, where they would go from city to city, trying cases wherever they went. And the local elites who welcomed them to their cities uh, carefully choreographed their visits. So they would have them go to the same buildings every time and meet the same people in the same way. And so they kind of created a script in stone for how these things were supposed to go. The governor had a lot of power. He could do a lot of good things for a city or bad things for a city. And they're trying to ensure that he's helping the city in the, in the most you know, uh, direct way possible by putting him in a place where the city seems most impressive, where there's a statue of the emperor next to where he sits to remind him to toe the line, where there's um, a statue of a Greek philosopher next to where he's looking on to remind him of the city's cultural glories. And so it, it combined my loves of archaeology and history, I think, in that I could look at these built environments. Um, I focus on what's now Western Turkey, so Ephesus, Miletus, Pergamum, those great cities, and um, say, okay, these ruins allow us to see how this played out in real time between governor and local elites. And we have enough sources, in the form of inscription mostly, epigraphic evidence, um, to kind of say what they were saying to each other um, and how this played out. And so tracing the dialogue between governor and local elite um, in these cities was what I was trying to do. And it ended up being both maddening and fascinating because no source describes this in explicit detail. We just have references and hints and stray you know, quotes. Um, but it allowed me to be creative by going to these sites and saying, all right, so, you know, I'm the governor, I'm sitting in this chair. What am I seeing? You know, how, what am I experiencing? And how, why does this matter? And, uh, you know, it didn't get me a job in the end, this PhD, but it did, uh, it was a fascinating way to explore the ancient world, um, and a good excuse, honestly, to travel quite a bit because, you know, I was able to spend quite a few months in Turkey at these different sites and then make the excuse that I was seeing co comparanda, you know, comparison sites elsewhere in the ancient world to go all over the Mediterranean. Um, so for, you know, five summers in a row, I was just gone for three months traveling. Um, and that was wonderful. You know, I've got these massive sheaves of pictures all over the place. And it helped me have a sense, I think, of how Roman cities work or could work, you know, on the ground and inform that slender, unreadable book up there. <laughs> well, <laughs> did you have like any assumptions going into those sites through your research that you were like, okay, this is how it's going to play out. This is what I'm thinking it's going to be, or it's going to feel like. And then when you got to the site, it was just totally different. You were like, well, mm -hmm. I have to rework this whole thing because this is not what I was expecting. Oh, sure. I mean, even if it's, if a city is reasonably well-preserved, um, the feel on the ground can be so different from even the best pictures and plans uh, my, my best example of that, um, I was I went to a site called uh, Termesis in south central Turkey. It's it's near Antalya uh, on the coast, and it's up in the mountains. It was abandoned in the fifth century and never resettled, so it's almost perfectly preserved. Um, it's a wonderful place with this jungle like overgrowth, uh, very very evocative. But anyway, the the main colonnaded street of this city um, was left as it lay when an earthquake knocked it all down in the sixth century. And so you can see lining both sides, these dozens of statue bases, you know, one after the other where they were set up. And walking down that avenue of statues um, was, I think for me, a transformative experience of seeing how there's a dialogue between statues and the passersby, you know, this one, then this one, then this one. And imagine the colonnades behind them because they're still half standing. Um, and, you know, the the Curia, the, the Senate House sort of at, at the end of all this. And so, yes, often being in a place helped me get a better handle on how it worked. And, um, and again, it, it was cool personally too, being able to see these things and imagine myself in these environments. So what triggered that thought process? Like, was there something in particular that you studied that you were like, wow, this is really interesting, or maybe like a story that you had read in the ancient source material because this is very niche, fascinating, but very niche and very specific. Extremely niche. I'm um, like getting a PhD, right? But also probably to get a job again. Um, so I had my first year of grad school, a seminar um, with the professor who ended up becoming my dissertation advisor. 
And he had a week where he talked about the travel of the Roman emperors. Um, we spent quite a bit of their time in the saddle, you know, going from place to place. And wherever they go, you know, there's a huge reception, of course. You know, everyone comes out to meet them. And there's a very carefully ritualized uh, little ceremonies that mark every step of what they do in these cities. And I remember thinking, you know, so this is, you know, I, I'd known about the governors that they traveled and just wondering how these played out, not for a topic, just kind of a little bit of reading on my part. And uh, I discovered that it hasn't been written about quite very much. People had written about what they did judicially, but no one talked about the spaces in which they were meeting these people and about what this meant. This this is Roman power. You know, the emperor doesn't come to most places ever. And if he does come, it's once a century, maybe, unless you're on the main roads going off to the frontiers. And so for these local elites who are often wealthy and powerful men, only their only experience of the, the Roman Empire is the tax guy showing up once a year and the governor. Um, and the governor is the most important representative of the, the empire that's ever going to show up in your city. And so, you know, this kind of is Roman power on the ground and how this dialogue works matters. It shapes your city's whole destiny, your tax breaks, you know, your status in the provincial hierarchy, your chances as a local elite for getting making it big in the provincial stage or going to Rome. And so the stakes are pretty high or it seemed to be pretty high and no one had written about it. So I plunged bravely into that breach and, uh, you know, four years later emerged dazed uh, <laughs> with what became that book. That sounds so interesting, and I'm definitely going to go see where I can find it so that I can. <laughs> you have to look pretty it. hard, I suspect, but good luck. <laughs> I'm sure I can find it somewhere because yeah, that it, sounds it, really it, interesting. Yeah, in London, you'll be probably like the UCL or something that they'll, they'll have it, I'd imagine. But yeah. I will march down there and go and see if I can <laughs> find it then. But with all of this research under your belt, something that I was curious about as well, you know, we spoke a bit about how you had to take Italian. Mm -hmm. What kind of languages were you dealing with with your PhD? Like, because you mm -hmm. were reading archaeological reports as well as this Greek right. epigraphy. So what were you having to muster through in order to get to that final stage? About three quarters of what I read was German. Um, all of the major sites in Turkey were dug by Austrian or German excavators. And so you have no choice but to slog through gargantuan heaps of German, um, which you know got easier to get better at it, of course. But it was never a, a stroll in the park because they always had these... You know, with good Teutonic thoroughness, every report from every you know year uh, you know, can be a full 300-page volume. And you can cherry pick from that, but there's still just so much to read. Um, so yeah, German and Greek were what I read mostly. Um, there was uh, some French scholar. I would say that the pie chart for what I was reading overall for my dissertation was probably half German, 20% English, 20% French and the rest Italian and then you know, other stun sundry languages that I was trying to, you know, Turkish for that matter was really hard to read. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it became, uh, you're trained, as I'm sure you know, and it is in a PhD program. Besides Greek and Latin, you learn uh, French and Italian, if you learn French and German, and Italian is expected if you're working in Italy. So, you know, I, I had reading knowledge of French and German before this, though I hadn't really practiced much with it. And so that was a, a trial by fire. I had to read a lot of German pretty rapidly. Well, and, I wanted uh, to ask about that because, I mean, I had what I, what I've always thought anyways, was like a really normal experience and everyone's like, this is not normal for an undergrad, but I took a course in uh, Apollo and Artemis, which was actually mm. really fascinating. It was all about like the different sanctuaries all around the Mediterranean Sorry. to those two gods. And um, <laughs> I ended up focusing because we were given a site each. And I ended up focusing on this site that maybe had like three bricks at it. Like it was one of those that there's just like <laughs> nothing there. There was a mm -hmm. teeny tiny statuette that was found. And my professor was like, that's your site for the whole semester. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. But there was an archaeological report about this site, which was all in French. And so as an undergrad, the professor mm -hmm. emailed me and was like, here's the report. I want to see you quoting the French, though, to really show that you're reading these things and not in translation. Now, lucky for me, I had a base in French, like because mm -hmm. I had done French my whole life, not in a way that's speaking. No one comment on this video in French. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be able to reply, but I could at least like read it. And I could stumble through it. So I was lucky. But when I've told that story to people like, well, an undergrad to have that being thrown at you is quite big. But also a mm -hmm. lot of people don't know that there are these other languages involved in classics that you have to be proficient enough in to read do you think that's something that like throws people off do you think it might intimidate people and what's mm. like the advice that you can give to somebody who heard that and was like oh mm. my god what <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is kind of blindsiding sometimes unless you do a little research 
beforehand, you wouldn't know going into grad school that you needed these secondary languages. Um, and, and I would say, first of all, that you know, really the, the amount that's written, it's less than it used to be. Now, most European scholars uh, publish at least some of their major findings in English too. But until about 70 years ago, if you were to choose one language besides Greek and Latin to learn the classics, it'd probably be German, to be honest. You know, that was the, the main encyclopedia, the Pauli, you know, all of these you know, great compendia of knowledge. Um, my advice would be, you know, if you're thinking seriously about graduate training in the classics, uh, first, think again, there are no jobs. <laughs> um, but, but, but second, um, you know, if you are determined you know, to be a masochist and get a PhD in the classics, um, it would be good, a very good idea to do a summer course in German, say, you know, to have, you know, at least some basis, a French or German, but German especially, um, just because you're going to have to learn that and it'll make your uh, leap into graduate school a great deal <laughs> less arduous. See, it's funny, like with the German thing, because I, I was lucky enough, I never had to encounter it because I just didn't do anything <laughs> after undergraduate, like my degree, <laughs> I was just kind of finished it. And I was like, I can still learn by myself, but where is this going if I keep doing mm -hmm. it aside from professorship so I didn't but with German I was like you know what I should probably get better at it so I downloaded Duolingo as like a 21 year old I was like I'll just keep up German <laughs> I took one class and realized that like not everything operates via a rule that they just have their own rules <laughs> in that language and I was like you know what mm -hmm. this is not for me this is I'm glad I didn't have to do it further than mm -hmm. knowing like woman girl boy <laughs> man <laughs> that doesn't operate mm -hmm. the same way. Yeah. And honestly, if you're an undergraduate, it, it was unusual for you before it had to read French, you know, for a course that was not language focused. I guess your, your professor knew that, you know, well, I guess, you know, being British, you had a better base in French than most Americans would, because uh, we do Spanish is our default language, as you know, second language. Uh, but, um, but even so, uh, yeah, it, it can be a lot. And even in my program, which so, so at Michigan, uh, where I did my PhD, there were three divisions in the PhD. There was either history, uh, Greek and Roman history, philology, and archaeology. And I was in the history side, which was the smallest of the three. But even for us, we, we read less than the philologists did because we also had different kinds of evidence. Um, our first two years were just languages, pretty much. Even though you're supposed to come in with Greek and Latin, you, you have to pass exams you know, in, in French and German, and then the dreaded reading examinations in Greek and Latin, where you're given four long sight passages in poetry and prose and have to render them in idiomatic English. And this, this is what reduces men to, men to tears, you know, when you uh, have to have to do these things, you get, you know, some wacky, you know, Hellenistic source. But uh, so there's a, there's a lot of language training. And I think, I wonder really in the future as, you know, computers get better at reading these things, whether these requirements vanish or change and become different, because it's just a means to an end of the languages. So there is a beauty, as I said before, in learning Greek and Latin and they're, you know, being able to read Virgil in Latin is a cool experience. But when it comes down to it, um, the time is not too far off when you could be a mono a monoglot and do everything. You know, when your 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 software will be able to instantly translate things accurately. And so I, I do wonder, even ten years from now, what these programs look like. They're probably the same because you know things change glacially in the, the in the classics. Um, but for hobbyists, you know, there really is no barrier to you learning the you know whatever you want in scholarship. Um, you know, in these sources because. You know, tech can be your your crutch, at least until you care to learn more about the languages, if you care to learn more. Well, now what I always tell my viewers to go to is um perseus.tufts.edu, mm -hmm. because at least oh, yes. you can you can pass that individual word. And at times when I'm panicking, I'm like, Perseus, mm -hmm. well, no, it's fine. Like I don't need to do oh, yeah. all of my research. <laughs> well, you can see the great, you know, shelf of lobes behind me there. Um the Latin's hidden down this way, so the red peeking out. But but yeah, that's what that is. That that's you know analog Perseus. <laughs> so you were briefly talking about how there are no jobs in classics, and mm -hmm. I would love to move to your experience then coming out of having your PhD, moving on to teaching. You say mm -hmm. on your website that you spent a few years lecturing until you left, and then mm -hmm. in an interview that you did. I am so sorry. I forgot who this person is, but I will link that interview as mm -hmm. an apology in the description below for everybody. <laughs> and you said in that interview that it was because you couldn't find a tenure job. So yes. I guess I have multiple questions about this, but I guess we'll start with for people who don't know, like what's the importance of getting a tenure job? Like what does that mean for mm -hmm. a professorship? Right. Well, a tenure job is a career. It's where you'll spend ideally the rest of your scholarly life. You're given um, after you're, you pass your tenure review, which is means let's say five years in many cases. You publish your first monograph. 
um, then you're guaranteed employment by the institution as long as you care to work. You know, so it's a uh, it's job security. It's uh, a good good payment, uh, excellent benefits, and summers off. Um, it's the professorial gig that your parents dreamed of, basically, if they were in academia anyway. Um, but the, the sad fact is that fewer and fewer jobs in the classics or humanities in general um, are tenure track. More and more are uh, contingent. You're a faculty for one year. You're hired on for a one or two year term. And after that, you might be up for renewal, but that's it. There's no security. Um, and also your pay grade stays lower than you would if you were tenured and you never really establish yourself in an institution. Below this are the sorry ranks of the lecturers, people who are paid a, a tiny fraction of what a professor makes, have no benefits, and are working really just for the, the promise of being able to launch themselves into a professorial job in the future. And it used to be this was sort of a, if anything, a rite of passage. You make a lectureship for one year if you finish your PhD, but you'd know afterward there was a real job waiting for you. Uh, now, sadly, more and more of us, the PhDs and the classics, are long-term lecturers where you're kind of caught in this loop teaching at one or two or even three, in my case, colleges simultaneously, um, getting paid not much more than minimum wage when you count in uh, class preparation with no benefits and future insight. You know, the, the, the job market in the class has been bad for a generation, but it got much worse after the Great Recession, 2008, and worse still after the pandemic. Um, so now I only know Michigan numbers. Um, less than half of us get jobs. And this is from one of the best programs in the country, or what used to be. Um, and so the rest of us are left to fend. Either you deal with the, so to, to my own story, um, you know, I, I finished in 2016. I finished my PhD, graduated, you know, got the funny hat and everything else. And, um, you know, was looking, of course, for tenure track jobs and couldn't find one the first year out. So I became a lecturer at Michigan, my, my own institution, where I taught in both the history and classics departments and had a pretty full schedule, made ends meet. So, okay, well, one more year. How bad could this be? Um, did it again. And this time, because I really did need money to pay off my loans and everything, um, I foolishly accepted jobs at two other universities. So I was teaching at Michigan. I should replace my advisor. I was the interim Roman, Roman history professor there for one year while serving as a professor of the classics over at Eastern Michigan and also at Wayne State, which is in Detroit and uh, nearby. And so I you was know, working 80 hour weeks, 90 hour weeks and making for all of that, uh, you know, fast food money, basically. Um, and, and so the long and short of it is that I, I decided that I couldn't do this for another year. And I just, if I didn't get a tenure track job, I was going to leave academia, which is what I did. And more than half of my contemporaries do the same thing. You know, there's just not enough jobs anymore. So that's what I was saying. If you decide to go into for a grad program in the classics, have a plan V, because I did not. I had like, I'm going to be a professor of history. And, so and maybe if I, if I had clung on, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. I was, I was just going to say, so did you always want to be a professor then? Like when you started taking it seriously, was that something that you wanted to do? Or was that just like the track that everybody was taking? And so you went, yeah, I'll be a professor too. It was kind of the default option. You know, I, I guess I never, I, there were lots of things about teaching I didn't like. No one enjoys grading. I mean, again, maybe the same person enjoys learning Latin grammar, enjoys grading. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't enjoy the certain kinds of classes, like the ones where it's a uh, smaller groups, you know, seminars where you're talking with the students, you can kind of sense their interest and feed that interest. But I always hated lecturing. I was never very good at lecturing. Um, and so it was sort of, again, a necessary evil. I would have done it to stay, to do what I really loved, which was research and writing. You know, I, what, what I loved about the idea of a professorship was that I was my own man. You know, I wasn't part of a corporate structure. I wasn't in a cubicle. Um, I was able to go off and foray into the world of knowledge and learn new things, you know, push the boundaries of knowledge farther. That's what always appealed to me, that kind of romantic idea of just, you know, getting into the weeds and learning new things that hadn't been known before, or at least putting a new spin on them. Um, and I kind of discovered belatedly that research can be a pretty rather small part of a professorial job. If you've read a, a teaching college, especially a smaller arts college, and most of what you do is just teach, and that's you know, the nature of the beast. But, um, you know, I always knew what I didn't want to do, and that was to have, again, kind of this structured office-style job. I always liked the freedom of being able to go off and travel of being able to, again, to research, to learn things. And it seemed that entering a professorial position was the only way to achieve that goal. I ended up finding a back door eventually, but that was kind of dumb luck. That is so interesting that you say that you, or at least you think you weren't a good lecturer because then you turn to YouTube and you do videos, which are mm -hmm. so fun and bite-sized. And then you have your other channels that offer because Told and Stone is one, and then you've got Told and Stone footnotes and CD mm -hmm. groups of the part. So you, you do so much, which I know isn't lecturing, but still is 
this way of teaching in such fun ways. And something that I was wondering, because, you know, to set up a YouTube channel, there are a number of different steps as somebody who also set up a YouTube channel. You don't just wake up one day and go, oh, I'll just do this. (laughs) So what was that catalyst for you that kind of pushed you into actually going onto (laughs) YouTube and signing up? Uh, Desperation, I would say. Uh, So I, um, after I, I left Michigan, uh, I had no clear idea of what, what what was next. You know, I had a little money saved up. Um, I moved my parents' basement for a while. <laughs> it got uh, fairly dire, but uh, I, I knew that. I'm like, okay, so I have this PhD. How can I use it? And the answer is, there's almost no way to use a PhD in the classics if you're not teaching classics, um, or want to enter like a weird consultancy job where you forget everything you learned and just say, I have a PhD and don't specify what you do. So I'm like, I decided that I would try, take a wild swing at entering the world of travel. Um, I would be a travel planner for historically themed, you know, journeys. And uh, it turned out that uh, what's something like a cool idea to me seemed like a cool idea to almost nobody else. You know, people who want to do these things just plan their own journeys typically, or they're part of a larger agency. And uh, I couldn't, I didn't manage to sign up with anybody. So I, I started Tolden Stone, the first version of Tolden Stone as a way of uh, this kind of bespoke travel agency. It was going to be a way to help people experience the ancient world. You know, I would help them plan their journeys. I think over three years, I had about four clients. Um, I think one of them didn't pay. Actually, I had three clients. Um, And uh, it was one of these things where, you know, there was was no future in that. That would be obvious within a few months. And so I had this, to to, uh, publicize Tolton Stone, Mark I, um, I created ToltonStone.com, the website. And uh, I decided to have this series that I would call A History of Rome in 15 Buildings. And I would trace the history of Rome from the beginnings, from the hut of Romulus, all the way through the 19th century. And I would take 15 famous monuments that did moments in Rome's development, in Rome's history. Um, and so when I created this website, I thought it might be fun to have YouTube videos that complemented uh, my, I wrote like a little short story for each one. I wrote up a, a long page. Um, and so I started my YouTube account for that reason. And initially it had almost no subscribers, you know, fewer than a hundred for the first year because it was just this, an an ancillary of this website. Uh, Then um, after I gave up on the travel thing and was despondent again, I'm like, well, okay, maybe I'll write a book instead. You know, like, yeah, that's not making any money, write a book. But I, I, in in my desperation, I thought I would write a book. And I had the idea of writing a book that would begin with kind of the crazy questions my students asked me over the years, you know, all kinds of off the wall things. When there was extra extra time after a class, I would often just have the students just kind of shoot questions at me. Like, okay, what else do you want to know about this period? And some things they asked were bizarre, but others came up again and again. I'm like, well, there's obviously curiosity about the ancient world in this off kilter way. What if I did a book that was just about the weird questions my student asked me and then answered them with little essays that address some large part of the ancient world? And so that was the, the genesis of the other book on the shelf there, the, the, the orange one, uh, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. And began that in 2019. To promote that book, I started taking YouTube more seriously. I'm like, well, okay, I'll do versions of my answers to these questions on YouTube. Um, and it's like the first one I ever did was, um, how did the Romans find animals for the Colosseum, you know, for the beast hunts? And so, you know, I, I threw together a 10 minute video about where they hunted, you know, which was everywhere from Scotland to, you know, the, the, the sub Sahel and, um, you know, cobbled together a pretty basic YouTube video. It was just a slideshow, really a barely glorified slideshow and put it on Tolan Stone. And, you know, nobody noticed initially it got probably a hundred views in the first week. Um, but I, I began to find ways to post these things on places like Reddit, um, Quora, you know, these question answering websites that would allow me to find an audience for what I was doing. And it, it didn't work efficiently at all. Like for, for me, uh, a good video got me 10 new subscribers and, you know, a couple hundred views. Um, but after, by the time I was done, or I was almost done with Tolden's with this book, Naked Statues, um, when the pandemic happened and that derailed all my other plans. And so I finished the book, you know, during my enforced leisure, the pandemic and started making more YouTube videos because I had a little more free time. I, I was tutoring on the side to make money. Um, and uh, But still, I had no real subscribers. I think I crossed 1,000 after f- almost three years on YouTube. It took me that long to get to the 1,000 mark. Um, the, the the real turning point came in uh, Pandemic Mark II in 2021, when people were still on YouTube a lot. So there was a, a critical audience there. But one of my older videos, um, which is called the uh, The Hidden History of St. Peter's Basilica, and it was much less sexy than the title suggests. It was just about the Roman materials in St. Peter's. But uh, this book, this video, 
Still Don't Understand went viral out of nowhere in April of 2021 and went from 1,000 views to 500,000 in a single week, um, which you know was my foot in the door on YouTube. I suddenly had 10,000 subscribers, which I never expected to have. And you know, I had enough free time then. I was just tutoring to make money. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe, maybe YouTube is a thing I can do. You know, the book wasn't published yet. I was still working on the finishing up naked statues. And uh, to my astonishment, YouTube was a thing I could do. You know, I, I started doing a video every week, and the numbers crept up. So by the time I was midsummer 2021, I'd, I'd crossed 50,000. 50, um, in September of that year, I crossed 100,000. Um, and at that point, it became viable. You know, I could actually make money on YouTube, um, which is, as I'm sure you know, is actually really hard to do. <laughs> it's at Google AdSense, you know, which is the basic ad, ad payment program um, is kind of stingy. You don't get much money for that. You have to find external advertisers. It's a whole other game. But um, I'd come to the point, and actually it was right about the time I, I had no money left and I had to decide whether I was going to get a real job or I don't know, live in a railroad car somewhere uh, that, you know, that this happened. And I suddenly had this ray of hope, you know, that YouTube could be a career for me. And um, you know, by working hard at it, and by getting lucky more than a few times, there's some videos doing well at the right, right moments. Um, I built Holden Stone, my, my YouTube channel uh, into, you know, a, a going concern. And it's not big now by YouTube standards, but it, it's big enough to keep me going. It's huge in the ancient history field. <laughs> yes, it's true for that, that little space that we're in it's something, but it's, you know, like most channels that have that many subscribers because on just that one you have like half a million nearly half a million subscribers most channels mm -hmm. that have that much a general history and you're just like your little corner of rome where mm -hmm. you're like i just enjoy this and here are all the videos like when i saw that number because i started following i think it was two years ago at this oh, point yeah. you're like, at the beginning then or towards yeah, the beginning. like mm -hmm. right like I remember when you kind of like just started because I watched that Peter's Basilica video. Oh, you did, and I was yes. like, oh, uh -huh. this is so interesting. I didn't think I'd be here in this corner of the internet. But <laughs> so I did. watched yeah. that video and I was just like amazed by how rapidly the channel grew and then grew into other channels as well. Did you, when you started YouTube, did you ever see it going into then told in stone footnotes and oh no, no. <laughs> oh no, no, there, there was no plan. Uh, I, I never imagined that I would have a thousand subscribers, let alone uh, 442,000. It, it's it's one of these things where it just snowballed. I suddenly had this chance to make the channel more than just a hobby. And um, I started the, this two smaller channels last year because I had all this content that didn't fit really on told in stone, um, travel footage in the case of scenic roots and uh, interviews, you know, podcast stuff and more you know, less formal content for uh, footnotes. Um, and so it, that was sort of a, a second tier where that there was ways to create these subsets of audiences within my my following um, and followed on from that. But uh, yeah, no, YouTube has just been one moment of serendipity after another, to be honest, where you know, I, I never, I, I'm the last person on earth who should be on YouTube, honestly. You know, I, yeah, I, I, I can write. I, I, I think that the one thing I do well in the whole business is write, is write reasonably well. The rest of it, you know, the visuals, I'm still a babe in the woods with. I have an editor, fortunately, a video editor who helps me with that stuff. But, uh, but the rest of it just, you know, still feels kind of surreal. But I think that, like, even the way that you package the videos like with the titles, like, you have that video, oh, how to get, um, is it how to get a good seat in the Coliseum? Mm -hmm. Like that, like that's such a good title. Like when I read your titles, I'm like, damn, those are some great <laughs> keywords. And I'm curious about it. Like, like I think all, oh, of, well. all of that you're really good at. Like I've got to give yourself more credit, Garrett. What's going on? All right. Well, in that case, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> pat myself on the back. But yeah, a lot of it's learn, learn on the job. You know, you see what works and what doesn't work. You, you discover, you know, what kind of scripts, you know, draw the audience in, what kind of titles and thumbnails, of course, as you know, um, you know, can make or break a video so easily. But uh, but yeah, and I'm still learning. I still have no idea why some videos flop and others fail. It's uh, mysterious. So you had no like camera training, acting training, anything like that before getting onto YouTube? Nothing approximating that, which is probably still quite obvious. But yes, no, I had, um, even now I have a hard time making myself slow down and use the Tolton Stone voice, which is much more deliberate than my actual voice. Um, and so it's one of these things that, uh, again, you, you learn by doing. And I'm still learning and I probably will as long as I'm on YouTube. So what was that like then for you? Because I think, I mean, when people talk to me, even my friends or people who follow my channel, they're always like, oh, I want to start a YouTube channel, but, and then there's mm -hmm. always like eight or nine different things that they're like, I don't know how to edit. I don't know how to film. I don't know how to set up lighting. I still mm -hmm. don't set up lighting. I'm using my desk lamp right now. So oh, yeah. 
yeah I just you know. have a, a light up there <laughs> but I think um, there's always like a but on the end of that so like for for those people I guess from your experience mm-hmm. how just how was the experience for you like how was it was it nerve-wracking did you just not even realize you needed to know those things was it kind of because in mm-hmm. my sense it was total ignorance I didn't know YouTubers did that at all until I started doing videos and I was like oh mm-hmm. oh people put time into that Oh yeah, no, ignorance is bliss. And that was the case for me as well. I had no idea what I was doing. And it helped. I could just march blindly ahead and make all these errors without realizing they were errors until later. Um, so I look at my videos, my first videos now and kind of shudder to think that it worked, but it did work. And that is a lesson in itself that you know people care a lot less about the window dressing, about you know how good your audio is, unless it's really bad, um, or how good your lighting is. And they care about the content itself. You know, that it ultimately, or at least we tell ourselves this, quality tells and that if you create tell a good story if you choose the right topic people will follow you there or at least one hopes so and um you know again there, there's all kinds of excellent reasons not to start a youtube channel um but what, what i would say that for those people who think about doing it is not to expect success quickly um that you know it took me years and honestly and it only worked not for something i was doing but because you the algorithm and its infinite lack of wisdom took up one of my videos and gave me a chance to do more. Uh, And so YouTube, I would say, is a great hobby, but it's a really rocky career. (laughs) It's one of those where if your income is YouTube, um, it's very stressful. And so uh, just kind of know that going in. It's kind of classics. You know, it's a it's a wonderful to learn these things. It's a cool skill set to have. But, you know, job security is is not really there. Absolutely. Picking up on what you said about the content of things, like I didn't get a microphone until like a few months ago, like July or something. I got a microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But before that, like my phone audio was fine enough that it was like, it wasn't terrible. And I was Mm -hmm. still getting like tens of thousands of views on, because I did summary videos of text. So people don't want to read the Iliad. Welcome to Mm -hmm. my channel. I'll give you all the answers. And Mm -hmm. people wanted that content so much that the audio didn't bother anybody. And right. that's something that I always tell people when they say, oh, I don't have this and I can't afford this. I'm like, neither could I. Yeah. I mean, I, I had your mic, you know, the, the Blue Yeti uh, for a couple of years and and it was fine. You know, I, 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 I can't really battered one. It was still absolutely great. You know, I, I bought this, you know, the SM7B here only when I started the podcast and really only to make my video editor happy because he's kind of an audio person. You know, he needs that high quality, crisp audio. And so I took the plunge for, for his sake. Um, but really... Yeah, the the hardware shouldn't matter so much. It's more you if you have an idea, you know, a good idea for a channel that's not been done before, because then you think you can do better than anybody else or do in a different way from anybody else. You know, again, it it is a cool hobby. There's something about finding an audience, about making those, you know, whatever parasocial sort of relationships. They are relationships still um, with your subscribers. You know, that that matters. It's sort of, um, I think probably because mine was during the pandemic when everyone was so isolated that I, I took off. Um, that was a big part of it for me initially that I had, and for someone who had left the classroom, that I suddenly had tens of thousands of students, so to speak, who cared, who wanted to learn more. And any teacher, that's, that's what they're in the game for, ultimately. You know, it's not for the money. You know, God knows it's not for the money. Um, it's because you love a topic and you want to see other people share that love. And you know, YouTube does that. It brings you to an audience that can be bigger than you could possibly imagine, but you know, only if things work. <laughs> and, you know, if it doesn't work, though, and you're doing it for yourself, you know, keeping that in mind that the goal ultimately is, to, you know, to make a few connections this way and to share what you've, you're passionate about. So I think if you come at it from that perspective, it can be, you know, for me, YouTube is a constant frustration. You know, half of my life is spent agonizing about how this video is doing or that that video is doing. But if you're not doing it for a living, which again, I don't recommend unless you're Mr. Beast or somebody, um, you know, and, and a very are, great well, example of somebody that yeah, just makes so much money. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, the only kind of way to make money on YouTube is to have tens and millions of subscribers. No, it's it's one of these things that, um, as a hobby, I think I could see it be very fulfilling. You, know, you don't have the pressures you have when you have it as a career when it's suddenly you know. And I, I worry myself sometimes about how much I'm not pandering to an audience, but trying to chase an audience that might not even exist with my topics. There are things that I find fascinating, and then it's not something that so well onto what other people find intriguing and. You know, it's a push and pull. But uh, anyway, so closing words for that are it, it's it's always possible um, if you approach it with the attitude that I'm doing this to share something I'm passionate about, not I'm going to make a million dollars in the first year or ever. So what's the video that you're most proud of making then? Whether it be, it doesn't have to be overall production. 
you know, it can just be, oh, that was a topic that I'm really mm-hmm. proud that I broke down or maybe it is the video style or mm-hmm. if you have one. The one that was the most fun for me, I would say, and one that was called, it was for Halloween a couple of years ago, and it was called The Vampires in the Ancient World. And I, I told three vampire stories um, that I dredged up from different corners of, of, of classical literature. But I told them to the accompaniment of only paintings from Pompeii, these very faded paintings from Pompeii. And so it was like this um, this, this slow procession of images that were all very faded and distorted and discolored. It really set the tone very well. And I put a lot of effort into the audio for that one. You know, kind of, I did different voices and stuff. Um, so it was, I've done huge amounts of research for some videos. Um, you know, like I, I did one um, about how much Roman gold still exists today. And so I was playing on my iPhone at that point. I knew there was gold in the circuitry. I'm like, I wonder if the gold in this iPhone was ever in some Roman thing. It's just a random thought that came to me. And this became a very deep dive into how much gold was mined in the Roman world, how much that compares to what the, the current gold stock, um, this you know wild jaunt through a lot of weird research that ended up with um, me saying that roughly one half of 1% of all gold uh, is it, that now exists today is from the Roman period. But um, so I would say that, that that those two videos, you know, one for just being a creative sort of production, even though it's not a very complex video, and the other for being and a weird kind of question, but an interesting question, and one that I had to do some pretty unorthodox research to answer. Um, those two, the gold video and the vampire video, are sort of the poles of, of what I like to do on YouTube. So what I think is interesting is that you started Told in Stone with the idea of travel, and then you make this YouTube channel, Scenic Roots, which is so fun. Again, obviously, all the links are in the description below, guys. <laughs> but now you have just planned a trip to Algeria, with a yes. travel company. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, it's actually the, the second trip of planning um, for this coming year. I, I'm doing one in Rome also, and actually I have two others planned for the fall possibly. You know, I, I've always loved travel, obviously. I, and my grad school has spent so much of my time, you know, wandering from ruin to ruin uh, for my research or, you know, research. And uh, th- this Algeria trip is kind of a long held dream of mine. I've never been to Algeria. I've been to Tunisia, I've been to Egypt, I've never been to that, that part, that corner of North Africa. And there are so many wonderful things there from Tim Gad by the best preserved planned Roman city, um, Jamila. And uh, the idea that I can travel to these places I haven't been and as a guide, you know, as someone, so I, I don't know the site so well. I'm more of a general, you know, Roman history contextual guy. Like here's why it matters to say this, this city is planned. Here's why it matters that the Romans conquered this place. Being able to join people who are fascinated by ancient travel or by, by ancient world, I mean. Um, and to make a bit of money while doing it is sort of a dream of mine. You know, it definitely beats the YouTube grind where you're sitting over a script, you know, agonizing about where to place your ad break. Uh, so the Algeria trip is um, what I hope to make a kind of a habit moving forward where, you know, once in the spring and once in fall, I head over to some part of the Roman world and lead a tour um, of people who are fascinated by the ancient, by the, the classics uh, and company with a local guide who actually knows all of the nooks and crannies of these places and try to uh, make that part of, the tone zone experience. I make content too during these things. You know, I make videos whenever I travel, but it's more uh, keeping in touch with that, uh, my, my roots, so to speak, you know, that, that first touch of the Pantheon's column. I'm still doing stuff like that by going to these new sites and uh, exploring them in this way. It looks amazing. I literally was looking at the page the other day and mm-hmm. it's like nine full days. Oh, and yeah. it was just like, I, I was reading every single day going, I need to figure out a way to make this much money and go because <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, it, it is. It is too bad that that, that, one, that one's kind of expensive. But I've never one planned coming up. Stay tuned. That's much less so. Um, and uh, you know, the hope is that um, again, I hate, there, I hate there to be a barrier to entry for anybody. You know, I, I want everyone to experience these things, but it's just a, a matter of the. There's so much prep work that goes into a trip like that. You have to hire a bus. There's a, a bunch of visa work that goes into it. Um, I was going to say it, it's not, I, I think that there are lots of just generally speaking, like influences that will do like travel, of know, course, whatever it is, whether they be makeup people or, you know, lots of influencers do this and you see the price and you're like, I can do that for cheaper. But mm-hmm. looking at the Algeria trip specifically, I was like, I couldn't plan something this mm-hmm. well. Like I couldn't do this all myself and do it for a reasonable price. Cause I wouldn't know what a reasonable price is. Mm-hmm. Like 
that's what I think is, I think the Algeria trip is priced really well. If you guys have the money, you should definitely <laughs> go. Like, again, I was literally like, what can I do in the next month that will make sure that I can go? Because <laughs> it seems so reasonable and so good, like with the travel, with the sites, with the, uh, as well, like a local guide and the food and just everything is included. Yeah. I mean, I hope it's not extortionate. It's definitely, it's, it's, it's not, not nothing, but um, I'm hoping it's, I tried to make it fair as far as I could. And, uh, but anyway, yeah, the, the idea of being able to travel, um, being paid to travel essentially with people who love what you do. I mean, it, it's a, it's a wonderful part of the pseudo influencer lifestyle that I apparently lead now. Um, actually, I, actually, I checked, apparently I'm a micro influencer. I guess if you have less than a million, you're still a micro influencer. So I'll, I'll take it still. <laughs> I'm in the game. Um, it's always really humbling when you see those. Cause I'm like a nano influencer <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, okay. God. <laughs> It, it seems so demeaning, doesn't it? They didn't have to use those words. The prefixes are so cruel. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, so so the Algeria trip, um, right after that, I have this Rome trip I'm doing, a shorter Rome trip. And then I, I'm working on two for the fall of 2024 um, to other parts of the classical world. So again, stay tuned for those of you who are Tolden Stone subscribers. Can we um, expect, since your interest, or at least it started, your expertise started in the Eastern Roman Empire. Can we expect more stuff gearing that way? At not, I don't mean in 2024, but I just mean in the future. Mm -hmm. I hope so. You know, as I mentioned before, you're always trying to follow interest as a YouTuber. You're, you're trying to guess what your audience wants to see, and you make the content accordingly. So I tend to focus recently on the West, you know, on the city of Rome itself, which was not my main research at all when I was in grad school. But you know, something I found interesting, but I'm not by no means an actual expert on the PhD level about Rome itself. It's more that there's so much happening in Rome, and Rome epitomizes so many things happening in the ancient world, you end up coming back to it again and again in videos. I would love to do more with the Greek world, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's neglected in Western scholarship and on YouTube, especially. You know, everything from Greek philosophy of the Roman period uh, to these great cities like Ephesus or Alexandria or Antioch. And so, yes, is the short answer. I do hope to do much more with that. Um, the hard part is to how to do that while still making money, and then we'll, we'll figure that out. But uh, it's definitely, there's so much there. I think I can lead people to it if I package it the right way. Um, so I was thinking just off the end of this interview to wind it down, because I know that you're interested as well in other areas of history. So you've mm -hmm. mentioned that you're interested in American history and early imperial China? Yes, yes. I, I did a course called <laughs> Rome and China um, when, when I was teaching at Michigan. And it was a huge amount of fun to compare um, Han Dynasty China with the Roman Empire on a structural level. Think about how empires about the same size, about 50 million people at the same time can work so differently. Um, but anyway, so I love comparative history. I don't do it very often on YouTube, but there's another future direction I'm hoping to pursue. Well, that was going to be the question. Like, can we mm -hmm. expect, again, not in the next year, I'm not asking for dates or anything, but mm -hmm. just at some point, do you think that's something that you would then expand into and move into discussing? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I have, so I have my, my planning document, which is this very long and very untidy word document where I have featured video ideas all laid out. And I have short-term, medium-term, and long-term sections. And at the head of the long-term section is a series on Roman China. I would love to do like a six-part or even 10-part series thinking about on the structural level, you know, thinking about emperors in these two places, about even um, philosophy, you know, comparing, you know, Stoke philosophy with various kinds of Oh, everything from legalism to a Confucianism. And, and so there's, I think, huge potential for that kind of YouTube content or even, you know, general content. You know, I'm happy by not, by not knowing Chinese there, but there's enough good secondary stuff I can make at least a YouTube video um, on, on, that, on those principles. Um, but I would love to do more like that, kind of longer term projects that take a deep dive into how... Well, ancient empires work for one thing, but these grand questions of history, you know, nothing but thinking about the Roman Empire as one kind of empire that we can think with, but not just about. Um, so yes, anyway, long, long answer short, um, I want to do much more with that kind of history moving forward. That seems like a stay tuned if I ever heard one. <laughs> so thank you, Garrett, so much for joining me today and for chatting with me about all things told in stone and most importantly for allowing us to kind of you know peek behind the curtain and to get to know you a little bit more that is really special and i really do appreciate that you were willing to do that and obviously thank you to all of you guys who continue to watch the channel support the channel so thank you so so much 
And as I said at the start of this video, you guys can find all of Garrett's links in the description below. And we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.